Hello, everyone. This presentation is going to cover why Bangap Silicon Carbide uh, Solutions. Uh, my name is Stephen Chenis. I'm an applications engineer in the discrete power management group here at uh, Microchip. Why Bangap Technologies have uh, different operating uh, conditions, parameters, and, and, and they, in many cases, exceed the performance of standard silicon uh, and, and also gallium nitride uh, products. If you look at the chart on this page, you'll see silicon carbide is, is really targeted towards higher voltage applications in the range of six or 700 volts and above, um, as well as higher power and higher frequency um, applications, uh, generally above about three kilowatts, is where you start to see silicon carbide excel in performance over standard silicon and at higher voltages, uh, gallium nitride products. So the benefits of, of using silicon carbide are um, when you operate during uh, conditions of, of higher voltage, is that there, uh, you'll see lower switching losses. And lower switching losses means that you could run your products at higher switching frequencies, and, and therefore your overall solution, um, including your, your uh, thermals, your uh, filters, your magnetics, your capacitors, can all be uh, smaller, lighter, um, and, and lower cost. So com comparing some of the performance and, or some of the characteristics of silicon carbide versus regular silicon, um, the first thing we like to talk about is the band gap energy. And, and the band gap energy is, is the energy required to get electrons flowing. Um, in silicon carbide, it's generally about three times higher than that of, of silicon, which is why we call these products uh, wide band gap. So the advantage of that is is that because it takes more energy to uh, rip these electrons from their orbits and get them flowing, um, you, your performance at higher junction temperatures um, is much better than that of, of silicon, which means you can run these products at, at higher junction temperatures, and so your cooling requirements aren't as, as stringent as for regular silicon. Also, because of the higher energy, your breakdown um, electric field is going to be much, much higher. And because of that, we don't have to have uh, as thick a silicon or uh, epi layer. Um, the arm resistance is therefore much lower for, with all things being equal over regular silicon. And, and this lower arm resistance means uh, smaller die size, higher efficiency in, in, in operation. Also, with these products, the thermal conductivity of silicon carbide is, is much higher than that of uh, regular silicon. And, and again, it relates to you know, improved cooling requirements. Um, and just like with silicon, uh, if you're going to parallel devices, either you know, discrete devices you know, on a board or die in a module, uh, because of the positive temperature coefficient of the arm resistance, uh, it makes uh, paralleling these devices uh, much, much easier. So you can't just replace silicon uh, with silicon carbide and expect to see all these, these improvements in performance. You really have to have a, a top-down approach to designing with silicon carbide. We had a, a, a customer that did an analysis for a uh, 225 kilowatt three-phase inverter for a motor drive for an electric vehicle. And, and what they found is though, even though the silicon, the semiconductor cost had doubled, a little bit more than doubled, the overall cost of the solution and the size of the solution was lower because you can reduce your, uh, your battery requirements, you can reduce the size of your magnetics, um, and, and of course you can reduce the size of your thermal uh, solutions. And in addition to that, they found that even with all these reductions in, in battery and, and so forth, um, the electric vehicle range was extended by 5 to 10% using the silicon carbide solution. And, and 
the takeaway from this slide is that you really need to do an overall design. And we'll go through some of the requirements of silicon carbide later on uh, in this presentation. So to compare it with gallium nitride, um, the, the overall summary here is that below 600 volts, gallium nitride is, is very competitive with silicon carbide in terms of performance. Uh, it will switch a little bit faster and, and it has, um, you know, really uh, slightly better performance, lower cost at, at those lower voltage applications. Above 600 or 650 volts, you'll see that silicon carbide has a much better performance, including uh, a more stable RDS on over temperature or RDS on temperature coefficient. Uh, its, its temperature coefficient is much less than that of uh, gallium nitride. The other important uh, item to note is that there is a, a fairly robust UIS avalanche rating uh, for silicon carbide, whereas for gallium nitride, there's really no um, there's really no UIS rating, and a lot of that has to do with the way the device is is designed. There's really no um, body diode or parasitic you know body diode uh, structure in gallium nitride. Um, and so therefore, if you need to have um, some sort of freewheeling diode or freewheeling ability, um, you'll find that the uh, vol voltage drop during that freewheeling event is much higher with gallium nitride and therefore requires, um, in many cases, an external diode. So let's talk a little bit about the silicon carbide uh, diode and MOSFET characteristics here. The goal in, in most designs is, is higher efficiency, and in doing that, there's a few tricks that you can use. One of the ways to do that is to select the correct topology. Right? You could use lossless snubbers, you can use zero voltage or zero current, or, or possibly resonant topologies to reduce those uh, losses. And the other tool in the toolbox of, of an engineer would be the semiconductor devices that are used. So in power loss, there is, there is two types of loss. There's conduction and switching loss. Uh, conduction is the uh, power dissipation in the device when the device is on and, and conducting current. And switching loss occurs when you turn the device on and off. And that's dependent on not only the bus voltage and the current, but also the switching frequency and how fast you can turn these devices on and off. A lot of times in, in choosing devices, you use rules of thumb, and although these aren't really something you should you know, totally depend on, it, it's, it's good to have a, a better idea of, of these rules of thumb when you're selecting devices. In general, if you look at a data sheet for a MOSFET, it'll give you a current rating. But this is a current rating that has some restrictions, including uh, being able to keep the case or the, the package temperature at a certain temperature, which sometimes is difficult to do. And also, this doesn't really include the switching losses. It's only rated at that current for uh, DC conduction or when the device is on. In real applications for switching power supplies, you'll have both conducted losses and switching losses as well. And therefore, when you pick a MOSFET or when you're looking at MOSFETs, in general, you should pick something that's two to four times higher, rated higher than the actual current that you're going to see in your application. For voltage ratings or D ratings, even though silicon carbide has a very robust UIS or unclamped inductive switching uh, capability, um, in, in general, for higher reliability and, and to meet some of the uh, higher MTBF standards, um, you should pick something that's generally 30 to 50 percent higher than the bus voltage you'll see. And, and that helps accommodate for over voltage conditions, for uh, ringing, and, and for transients um, that may occur during normal or, or uh, during abnormal operation. Uh, especially if, if there is some short circuit 
or high current uh, events that occur that could boost the ringing or the uh, voltage that the device sees uh, to be much higher than that, the rated bus voltage. Some of the, the characteristics that you'll see for silicon carbide are that the, um, the, the body diode, all right, is roughly in the three volt range. And this is higher than the typical 0.7 to one volt that you'll see for uh, standard silicon MOSFETs. Again, with wide uh, band gap type devices, the energy required or the voltage required in order to break down the, the junction and, and forward voltage drop is going to be uh, a little bit higher. Um, common applications um, in the 400 to 1000 volt range or what we would commonly see when using silicon carbide MOSFETs. Um, the range that we have uh, existing for release parts right now is 700 volt, 1200 volt, and 1700 volt devices. In general, you can see switching speeds uh, from uh, in the 10 to 20 nanosecond range. Those are most common, um, and that's across the full voltage range. So for a uh, 1200 volt MOSFET, say, you could easily see 15 to 20 nanoseconds from zero to the 1200 volt. Um, and that is uh, fairly high in terms of DVDT, but the silicon carbide devices are, are able to take uh, even much higher uh, DVDT uh, switching um, than, and that, that exceeds the standard silicon uh, MOSFET uh, DVDT capability. Um, in, in terms of, of RDS on in, in different devices, um, you could easily use, for example, a 40 milliohm um, TO247 package device in an application that's switching uh, 40 amps. And for gate drive, depending upon how fast you want to drive, the size of the MOSFET, or even whether you're, you've, you're driving several MOSFETs in parallel, your gate drive currents can range anywhere from one amp um, all the way up to 20 amps peak uh, in the gate circuit. Uh, for modules, you can see uh, current ratings anywhere from 50 amps to 600 amps uh, in the 1200 volt range, 700 volt range for these modules because they have multiple die uh, in parallel in each of these packages. Talking about paralleling MOSFETs, silicon transistors have a very high positive uh, temperature coefficient for their RDS on. And this allows them to be paralleled very easily. Uh, as you, if you have more current flowing through one of the devices in parallel, its RDS on will, it will heat up, its RDS on will increase, and therefore the current will be forced to go through the other um, MOSFETs that are in parallel. But one of the disadvantages of having a high temperature coefficient for RDS on is that at higher temperatures, you have much higher uh, power dissipation. If you look at the graph, you can see the, the, the blue trace is the uh, RDS on, normalized RDS on over temperature uh, for a standard silicon MOSFET. And the red and, and the green traces um, are the RDS on uh, temperature coefficients for uh, seven and 1200 volt silicon carbide. As you can see, the increase over a given temperature range is much, much less for silicon carbide, and that bodes well for reducing your power dissipation when operating at high temperatures. But if you, if you look at the graph, there's still a uh, positive temperature coefficient as you go up in temperature, and uh, this helps for allowing uh, good current sharing between parallel devices. Uh, one of the things you might note is uh, below about 25 degrees, you'll see a slight negative temperature coefficient uh, for silicon carbide. And you might think that this may you know, cause some, some problems with current sharing. Well, what happens in an actual circuit, in an actual application, is that um, as you start to use these devices, they start to heat up. And as they heat up, the temperature coefficient for RDS on uh, goes back to being positive, and that allows for uh, good current sharing. So one of the, the, the um, ways that we, we 
operate in high voltages to use isolated, uh, for example, isolated gate drives or we use uh, power transformers. And these isolated gate drives or these power transformers, uh, MOSFETs that are, are uh, isolated from heat sinks, they all have capacitance, uh, common mode capacitance that you'll see. And when you're switching at a very fast, at high voltages at a very fast rate, um, even a very small amount of capacitance um, can cause uh, common mode currents to, to flow. And common mode currents in a, in a power supply can lead from anything to uh, failing EMI um, or, you know, conducted or radiated um, or, or even uh, latch up of, of some of the control circuitry. Um, for example, in a, a very well-designed gate drive transformer um, or power transformer, you, you might see three picofarads of capacitance uh, between the isolated drive and, and the low voltage uh, side. And even that, at a pretty typical 75 volts per nanosecond uh, switching rate uh, of the MOSFET, of say the high side MOSFET, um, and it'll translate to almost a quarter of an amp of, uh, of a current pulse across that transformer or across that isolation barrier. And that's uh, fairly significant. So when you're designing um, with components, you have to take into account capacitive coupling um, effects uh, in order to have a, a, a good solution. The other um, would be your uh, package inductance or your circuit board inductance or your bus inductance. And that has a large effect on, on uh, circuit behavior. Um, when you're switching with uh, fast DIDTs, right, in a module or an, even in a discreetly packaged TO247 uh, device, you could be switching fairly high currents. And uh, taking a, an example, uh, if you have uh, just two nanohenries of bonding wire inductance, right, and you're switching that 20 amps in, say, a, a 20 nanosecond period, which is very typical for silicon carbide, you end up with about a four volt. Uh, drop across the bond wire. And if you look at how a gate drive circuit is, is connected, okay, and you have, say, two nanohenries between the source of the, um, of the, of the die and the package lead, uh, that four volts will be developed, and that will actually counteract um, the gate drive voltage that you're applying across the device. And, and it's actually like a negative feedback that causes the gate drive voltage to, um, to ramp a little bit slower. And what that will do is cause your MOSFET to switch slower. So if you're trying to optimize or, or maximize your switching speed, you need to minimize that, that uh, inductance. And in some applications, we have uh, four leaded, uh, which we'll go into in a little bit later, four leaded uh, packages where we isolate the gate drive uh, source from the power source. And this helps uh, reduce this effect of, uh, of uh, DIDT uh, voltage drop across the inductive bond wire um, and improve your switching uh, speed. The other, the other thing that you need to be aware of is for short circuit capability, um, you know, the advantage of, of having silicon carbide is that you don't need big, as big a die as you would for, say, uh, a silicon IGBT or, or MOSFET. And, and that has a lot of advantages, but there's also what the disadvantage is that it doesn't have the thermal capability to tolerate uh, long short circuit conditions, such as a larger die MOSFET or IGBT would. So in your design, you need to make sure that uh, short circuit currents are handled quickly um, to prevent damage uh, to the silicon carbide die. Another advantage of, of silicon carbide over uh, silicon is that the reverse recovery is either very small or non-existent in the silicon carbide. If you look at the uh, traces, the blue and, and the gray trace are uh, for a uh, silicon MOSFET reverse recovery of its body diode. And you can see that, um, that the ringing and oscillations are substantial. If you look at the orange trace, uh, that's the reverse recovery that you're seeing under the same conditions for um, silicon carbide. And as you can see, 
the energy as well as the, the amount of uh, peak reverse current are much smaller, uh, and that, that equivalates to um, uh, reduced EMI, reduced ringing, uh, over voltage. So there's significant advantages of using silicon carbide over silicon when it comes to uh, reverse recovery. So in addition to silicon carbide uh, MOSFETs, we also manufacture silicon carbide uh, shocky barrier diodes. Um, these are, are manufactured in the same voltage range as, as the silicon carbide MOSFETs, 712 and 1700 volts uh, breakdown voltage. And, and you can get not only higher voltage uh, shocky barrier diodes for silicon carbide than you can for ultra-fast diodes. Um, current range is, is roughly the same, um, but the forward voltage drop of the silicon carbide shocky barriers are much less than that of uh, not only the uh, fast silicon diodes, but also the body diode uh, of the silicon carbide MOSFET. They can also handle a much, much higher uh, DIDT uh, without any, any damage or um, excessive recovery, uh, as you would see for uh, standard silicon uh, fast and ultra-fast diodes. In addition, if you look at the, uh, the graph on the bottom of this slide, you can see that once you get over a uh, certain current, and as you, you will have a positive temperature coefficient, um, and this is caused by the uh, domination of, of the resistive elements inside the, uh, the diode. And what this means is that you can uh, easily parallel shocky barrier diodes like you can for, uh, for uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs. We had talked a little bit about uh, parasitics in, in, in um, the, the MOSFET and the package for you know, the lead, the bonding wire, but the DC bus inductance is also a consideration um, for the same reason that you're switching very, very fast uh, currents and voltages. Uh, bus inductance, if you have too much bus inductance, it will not only minimize your um, ability to switch quickly, but it will also cause uh, high ringing voltages, um, which could, again, not only reduce or produces EMI, um, but also uh, it increases the peak voltage that the MOSFET sees, um, and, and that will, will um, cause you to use possibly higher voltage MOSFETs. So one of the ways to minimize that is to use uh, high voltage uh, ceramic capacitors as close as you can um, and minimize that, that current loop. So you would have those capacitors in, say, a half bridge or a synchronous buck type configuration. You would have those capacitors connected between the drain of the high side MOSFET and the source of the low side MOSFET. In addition to that, you can use more uh, higher capacitance bulk capacitors, okay, but the ceramic capacitor is close to the, um, the drain and the source of these MOSFETs is very important to minimize the, uh, the, the, the peak voltage ringing uh, in the circuit. When using modules, um, there are some advanced modules that have very, very low inductance in the three to four nanohenry range. And the uh, SP6LI package is, is a good example of, of this kind of, of module. It was designed uh, to minimize inductance and therefore is, is a, an ideal uh, package for using silicon carbide uh, when switching with uh, very high DIDT. And um, with all these, these things that you can do um, for, for minimizing the bus inductance, you will still get a little bit of ringing um, because you're trying to switch these devices as fast as you can to minimize the turn on and turn off losses. So when you, you select your MOSFET voltage, as we mentioned in a previous slide, you have to make sure that it exceeds the uh, ringing, that the voltage breakdown rating of the MOSFET, or the module exceeds the rating um, that you'll see in the, uh, in the peak voltage across the bus. So one of the ways to, to do that is you can slow down this turn on and turn off, that will minimize the peak and the ringing, um, but that also comes at a cost of incre increased uh, switching losses. 
And, and you could also try damping the bus, um, and that also reduces EMI and ringing, um, but it really doesn't uh, reduce the peak voltage that you see um, uh, on that first inductive kick uh, when you turn the device on. For gate drive, one of the, the, the dis disadvantages of, of using silicon carbide, and, and this is done intentionally, is, is to um, have a lower threshold voltage. And because of the lower threshold voltage, sometimes um, you find that it may be necessary to use a negative gate voltage um, for turning off. So this is really different from silicon, uh, standard silicon MOSFETs. Their gate voltage is generally in the three to four volt range for high voltage MOSFETs. For silicon carbide, it's generally in the 1.7 to 2 volt range. So in many applications, we recommend that the negative gate drive uh, be at minus 5 volts or, or a negative voltage. And, and this, one of the advantages of using negative voltage during turnoff is that it reduces the turnoff losses because you have a much stronger drive uh, for turning off when you go negative on the gate. Um, Addition in using the um, the gate drive, you may want to add uh, on and off uh, gate drive resistors to minimize ringing and to control the turn on and turn off speed of the MOSFET. In, in some applications, um, you may be able to improve your efficiency, lower switching losses by using a smaller turn off resistor, right, for faster turn off and uh, maybe a slightly higher turn-on resistor for uh, reducing the ringing and, and for uh, optimizing the, the switching of the MOSFET. So, in, in general, uh, there are some differences between uh, switching or driving, uh, switching MOSFETs that are silicon carbide uh, versus silicon. Additionally, um, in, in the layout, you have to make sure that, um, that you have a very small uh, loop in your gate drive circuit. Uh, for the reasons that were dis discussed before, if there's too much inductance in the loop, um, not only will you get some ringing in the gate drive during turn on and turn off, but it will actually slow down uh, the maximum uh, switching speed that you can attain for a given gate drive circuit. Especially when, when driving uh, modules, you have to be careful that the, uh, not only that the gate driver um, has the ability to dissipate the power required for driving these big modules, but also the isolated power supply that you're using for gate power has enough uh, uh, current and power to drive these modules. Um, when you calculate the amount of power, it's the gate driver total gate charge times the switching frequency times the voltage that you're driving it at. And this voltage is the difference between the high, which is usually 20 volts, and the low, which is usually mi minus 5 volts. Uh, you have to take that into consideration for selecting both the uh, isolated power and also the driver IC's uh, power dissipation. Um, and again, with isolated gate drivers, as we had talked about before, they will see um, very high DVDTs. Um, some of the drivers, uh, especially the ones that were designed to be used with um, silicon IGBTs, uh, have a lower DVDT rating than is needed for silicon carbide. And so this is a factor. In general, we, we try to recommend using gate drive or isolation devices that are rated at at least 100 volts per nanosecond. And, and lastly, when you're probing um, nodes that are switching at very uh, high voltages and, and fast uh, DVDTs, um, you need to be careful about what you're using to probe. Um, in general, if you put a scope probe on a high DVDT uh, node, it will actually load uh, the, the uh, node down and this will uh, actually uh, alter the performance of, of the circuit. So that needs to be uh, taken into consideration uh, when you're doing probing and, and debugging of, of the circuit. 
So we covered this before in a few slides. Um, we'll, we'll kind of summarize it here is that the lead inductance, especially the source lead inductance, the silicon MOSFET set plays an important part in the performance. Um, for uh, some applications, it may be uh, necessary to use a four-leaded uh, TO247 package. Um, one of the advantages of this is that it has what we call a Kelvin source or an a separate source that's bonded directly to the die. So instead of the gate drive circuit um, seeing the peak current through the power source pin, uh, that source pin for gate drive is connected separately to the die. And the peak uh, voltage or the ringing that you see caused by the uh, power source pin and its bonding wire inductance is not seen by the gate drive circuit. This improves the gate drive, uh, reduces ringing on the gate drive, and allows you to switch these devices at, at a much higher rate, which reduces your turn on and, and turn off losses. And lastly, for paralleling devices, we had talked about this a little bit in previous slides, but uh, silicon MOSFETs are easy to parallel because of their positive temperature coefficient. Silicon diodes, uh, carbide diodes, the Schottky barrier diodes, also have a higher, um, at higher currents have a positive temperature coefficient and therefore are fairly easy to parallel. And in some cases, you may want to use a Schottky barrier diode um, to bypass or in parallel with the MOSFET to bypass the uh, MOSFET's body diode. In some applications where you may have a uh, long freewheeling period, the lower voltage drop of the Schottky barrier diode will reduce power dissipation and improve your efficiency um, in the application. So in conclusion, um, paralleling devices, um, we could parallel modules uh, down to a few milliohms. Um, we also can parallel uh, external TO247 or, or single die package parts um, pretty easily. Um, current sharing in modules is, is very good, and modules for high currents are a very good device as they have a very compact structure um, and board layout uh, circuit design is much easier for these applications. Uh, even with devices in parallel, you can easily go up to 500 kilohertz um, in switching frequency for silicon carbide. Um, as well as power levels uh, approaching 100 kilowatts. Um, and the modules are capable of uh, higher power at the lower frequencies, uh, and that really depends on the design of the module. Using a low inductance module package um, helps improve uh, switching loss and, and therefore allows you to go uh, at higher switching frequencies at higher power. At this point, we're going to uh, do an overview for silicon carbide uh, discrete module solutions. And I turn the presentation over to Orlando Esparza. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> so just a little bit of background on microchip and silicon carbide. You know, microchip has grown uh, over the last 20 plus years, and this snapshot shows the acquisition activity um, that has gone on over the last 10 years. So, so our approach is we develop solutions at microchip both organically and we acquire capabilities and new product solutions through acquisitions. So the last acquisition that we had was in uh, middle of 2018 and that was MicroSemi. Um, through that acquisition uh, came to us many new technologies and capabilities, one of which is silicon carbide. <clears throat> uh, this is an overview of microchip. Um, we are about a $6 billion company based here in Chandler, Arizona in the United States. Uh, we have approximately 20,000 employees. And with the acquisition of, of uh, MicroSemi, who was very strong in aerospace and defense, we are now the number one semiconductor supplier for aerospace and, and defense. So MicroSemi brought a lot of, of know-how expertise, 
um, and presence within A&D. On the other hand, Microchip was very successful in automotive. About 25% of our business prior to the acquisition was in the automotive market, um, and, and now that, that's lowered a little bit uh, just based on the new areas that we are serving um, uh, after the acquisition. Our particular group, Steve and, Steve and myself, we belong to an analog business unit uh, um, known as Discrete and Power Management. <clears throat> Currently, uh, about 50% of our business is in uh, aviation, space, and defense applications, and the other 50% uh, is within industrial and automotive. With the addition of silicon carbide, um, we see that as a key growth driver uh, going forward. We do anticipate uh, more business uh, within automotive, as that's the major market targeting silicon carbide, but also uh, also growing in other areas in industrial. <clears throat> uh, we have a, a um, what we call TSS or Total System Solution here at Microchip. We don't want to just sell a silicon carbide MOSFET or um, an op amp or an LDO. Uh, what we want to try to help our customers is solve their system solution and provide as much content as we can uh, within that system in addition to services and support. So this is one example of TSS, Total System Solution. Uh, this is uh, from our TreeLink tool. If you're interested, uh, you can find the TreeLink tool on microchip.com. It allows you to drill down to different product categories. In addition, there's an end equipment section, and this is from the end equipment section, showing a block diagram of a DC to DC converter. And in red are all the areas that microchip can serve from an analog or, or, or interface standpoint, and also uh, from a microcontroller standpoint. So as you can see, we're able to serve about 80, 85% of the overall requirement for this system. Uh, so as far as our silicon carbide portfolio, we just released the second generation uh, uh, family of products uh, here in green. You could see uh, on the left are the uh, Shockey barrier diodes that, that Steve um, um, discussed earlier, and on the right are the silicon carbide MOSFETs. So in total, we've released uh, about close to 50 different product options uh, within dye discretes uh, that are using this second generation family. Um, in addition, we also have a module capability here at Microchip. We have the ability to service standard modules, uh, semi-custom modules, and full custom modules. Um, we are in the process of releasing various modules that are now using the second generation silicon carbide products that we, we just showed on the previous slide. So those modules, um, are within different package types and within different topologies. <clears throat> as far as microchip, how we differentiate or what is our value proposition with regards to silicon carbide solution, we base this around what we call QSS, quality supply support. So let me jump into a little bit more detail on this. Um, as far as quality, uh, you know, we have the, the aerospace and defense heritage. We, we from, from the start of design or development of these products, we ensure that they meet uh, aerospace and defense standards, which are very stringent. And then we also leverage that, um, those designs and, and that, that high quality or high reliability to uh, products that can serve industrial and also automotive. So, um, I'm not going to get into each one of these, but these are how we support the value proposition of, of proven reliability and ruggedness within our devices. <clears throat> Supply is also a very big topic uh, with customers. Um, this is probably one of the first topics that, that could come up 
when, when engaging in, in new opportunities is, you know, everybody sees silicon carbide rapidly growing, the demand for it rapidly growing. Uh, some market estimates from 2018 show um, within the next seven to ten years, this market will grow from about 500 million to over 10 billion uh, within power semiconductor devices. So there's a lot of concern that the uh, supply will not will not be able to meet the the demand, and <clears throat> we we have a risk averse um, uh, approach throughout the supply chain. Um, I'll, I'll mention in particular, we have a dual fab uh, strategy where we will have two different fabrication locations um, that can manufacture these devices. That's unique to microchip. We're not aware of any other suppliers that um, have that capability. And then support. So <clears throat> we do, uh, as mentioned um, many times throughout the presentation, we do have the aerospace and defense know-how. We have the, the automotive know-how and infrastructure. So we really feel that we can help service the target end markets that silicon carbide uh, applications or that silicon carbide will, will be also be targeting um, within certain applications. So, and we are committed to serving not only large customers but also small customers um, within uh, other industries such as industrial. <clears throat> so as far as reference designs, uh, we do have reference designs available for evaluating both our modules and demonstrating our silicon carbide technology. Here on the left is, a, um, is our PFC Vienna. It's a 30 kilowatt uh, reference design targeting uh, um, or demonstrating uh, EV charging application. Um, this uses our silicon carbide um, uh, MOSFETs and, and diodes and uh, has a very high efficiency. We have design files available for download um, uh, on our website. So you can uh, access all of this information by going to microchip.com forward slash SIC. Um, in addition, we also have SPICE models available. Uh, these models currently reside on microsemi.com. Uh, we're still going through the integration process of getting all of the web content onto microchip, so we hope to have that completed by the second half of this calendar of, of 2020. So, in summary, um, you know some key takeaways. You know, microchip has a TSS or total system solution approach, which we try to uh, service all parts of the system um, and help our customers solve their problems. Uh, we have a broad portfolio of die discrete and module um, silicon carbide solutions. We have tools, collateral, and reference design available for our, our clients and our partners to help minimize uh, their development cycle time. And also microchip is, is known for very robust, very rugged, and high reliability products. Um, again, uh, please visit us at www.microchip.com forward slash SIC to find more information. Thank you for, um, for your time and, and, and um, attention to our presentation. Thanks. Alyssa, are you there? <laughs> 